My name's Jason Evans, and I've spent the last five years investigating the contaminated blood scandal. In the 1970s and 80s, thousands of people with the blood clotting disorder haemophilia were infected with hepatitis C and HIV through a blood product called Factor VIII. For decades, many of those held to be responsible for the scandal by victims and families have maintained there were no alternatives to the products that caused infections, and that without them, haemophiliacs would have died from bleeding. I want to know if that's true, and to do that, we need to go back in time. There is no cure for hemophilia yet. But someday, in the near future, the hemophiliac may be able to control his disease by injection. The plasma from many individual donations is pooled into larger, more manageable packs. Was it worth stopping the treatment because it was, was terrible? The precautionary principle might suggest we should have stayed with chronic precipitate, I suppose. In July 1964, the American scientist Judith Graham Paul announced that she had discovered cryoprecipitate, or cryo. It was a new treatment for haemophilia, and until the 1970s it would be the primary treatment for the condition. Gary Webster, a haemophiliac, recalls his experience. I certainly had cryo from 1968, 67, 68, all the way up to 1975 when I started college. Cryo was quickly hailed as a miracle treatment for haemophilia and Judith Paul had earned her place as a medical pioneer. But less than a decade later, cryoprecipitate was virtually abandoned. By the early 1970s, commercial companies had began to sell highly concentrated forms of Factor VIII. Large pool Factor VIII concentrate. These products were quicker to use and were more convenient. But they were made by mixing or pooling together the blood plasma donations of many thousands of people. This would result in two big differences. Firstly, by pooling so many donations together, as many as 60,000, this meant the chances of a virus being present in one batch was increased enormously. And secondly, as a manufactured pharmaceutical drug, it could be sold for money, and pharmaceutical companies began marketing. The UK began to import millions of units of the new product from the USA, where donors were often paid for their blood plasma, which was then used to make the new products. From the outset of the new product, it was appreciated in medical circles, the Department of Health and pharmaceutical companies, that there was a dangerous risk of hepatitis because of the sheer amount of donations used to make just one batch of the product.
Despite the risks, the convenience of the new product seemed to outweigh safety concerns, and in the early 1980s, a new threat emerged. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. Even in the face of AIDS, which was first described in 1981 and thought likely to be bloodborne by 1982, untreated large pool products continued to be used in the UK until well into 1985, when heated products which could kill the viruses began to be used. The result was that virtually every haemophiliac who used these products was infected with hepatitis C, which can cause severe liver damage, including cancer. Over 1,200 were also infected with HIV, and most of those infected with both viruses were dead by 1996. One of the big arguments for victims and families is whether we should have stuck with cryo until the large pool concentrates were at least reasonably thought to be safe. Richard Warwick was also infected with HIV and hepatitis C. I think if we'd been, been made aware of the problems with uh, commercial concentrates and the, the possible dangers of using it, then I would have certainly, without, without in a heartbeat, I would have gone back to try using cryo. If you offer me, me now, yeah, of course I'm, you know, yeah, and I think they could easily have done it. They did it, so they only stopped because they wanted to use Factor A. Right. So they've been used, doing it that way for 120 boys at, at college. Let's break down those arguments. The first one is home treatment. Many physicians now contend that home treatment with cryoprecipitate would have been near on impossible. Did you yourself have any direct experience of using cryoprecipitate for home treatment? No. Were you aware at the time, so 1980, early 1980s, that cryoprecipitate had been used, it would seem relatively successfully, for home treatment in the Royal Free Hospital and, and also in the Birmingham area? I knew that people, a <coughs> um, small number of centres, had used home treatment. I didn't know anything about the, the details. In your statement, you've set out a number of um, concerns about possible reversion to cryoprecipitate, some of which you've touched on in your oral evidence. You said in your statement that cryoprecipitate was incompatible with home therapy. We've heard evidence that of a number of haemophiliacs in the course of the 1970s uh, receiving home treatment through the use of cryoprecipitate. Would you accept well, that incompatible uh, is perhaps uh, an overstatement? I wasn't aware of that at the time. I am aware of it now. Not only was home treatment with cryoprecipitate possible, it was done. Another argument is that cryoprecipitate provoked severe allergic reactions that could be life-threatening. You have the 
likelihood of severe side effects, okay, you can get minor allergic reactions, but they can be extremely severe and could potentially be fatal. Um, um, it was very common to get um, uh, allergic reactions, particularly to plasma or cryoprecipitate. And it was more dangerous at an, an immediate allergic level. C can we just unpick some of the, 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 those, those issues, Dr Colvin? First of all, just dealing with um, the, the potential to give rise to an allergic reaction. Yes. Is there any data on how common that was? I'm not sure about scientific data. I'm not sure about scientific data. Now, although some reactions with virtually any drug are possible, the reality is that it seems severe reactions with cryoprecipitate were exceedingly rare. But the development of devices like the butterfly has meant that a once difficult procedure has been remarkably simplified. Next is the assertion that cryo was really difficult to make, mix or prepare. It's extremely inconvenient to make up. It, it becomes quite impossible to use it. Basically, um, cryo was um, a, a large volume. It took a lot of time uh, to draw up. It disenfranchised the family. Some now contend that cryo wasn't suitable for surgery or for people with severe haemophilia. Dr Forbes is absolutely right. If somebody's having major surgery, you must have concentrate. Uh, you can't rely on cryo or plasma. It's, the, the patient's just going to bleed. So why don't the arguments now put forward by some doctors and the government stack up to the evidence that we've seen from the time? The answer to that question might be found in Finland. Unlike the UK, most haemophiliacs in Finland were maintained on cryo throughout the 70s and 80s until heated products became available. and the majority of those patients had severe haemophilia. 
The result was that only two haemophiliacs in Finland were infected with HIV, as opposed to more than 1,200 in the UK, and more than half were spared hepatitis C infection. In 1990, Visa Rassi, a former doctor at the Finnish Red Cross Blood Transfusion Service, wrote, Cryoprecipitate was long used as the sole form of factor VIII substitution therapy. The large pool preparation was not introduced to clinical use because of the increased risk of viral infection, i.e. hepatitis. With Finland sticking to cryo and proving it wasn't only possible, but made a huge difference. Why has there been a new narrative in the UK to destroy the reputation of cryo, even by those who seem to truly believe what they're saying? Some of those impacted that I've spoken to have accused the new narrative of being an outright lie, but I think there might be something deeper going on. Historical Negationism Historical negationism, also called denialism, is falsification or distortion of the historical record. Something that you find when looking at the careers of most, or if not all of the people now pushing this narrative, is that they became involved in haemophilia care or related matters at a time after large pool concentrates had been introduced. The book Blood Product Therapy and Haemophilia was edited by Christine Lee and Peter Kernoff, who were both working at the Royal Free Hospital in London during the time in which infections were taking place. It was in part funded by one of the US manufacturers of Factor 8, Alpha, and purports to be an authentic record of the history of haemophilia treatment. But there's just one problem. When analysing the papers contained in this book, aside from Judith Poole's 1964 discovery of cryo, none of the papers seen in this film are included in the book. For all intents and purposes, cryo has been written out of the history of haemophilia treatment. The passage of time means that most of those who saw the advent of cryo in their medical career have now passed away. Many of the medical and government witnesses that are here appear to be advancing third-hand arguments that only began to be made after the scandal came to light. From everything I've seen, these arguments just aren't supported by the documents at the time or the outcomes. In other words, the historical record has become distorted. The reality of the time has been changed by those who may seek to use the new narrative to deflect blame, avoiding acceptance that many haemophiliacs needlessly died. And that's a pretty tough thing to accept.